All right, uh, so today we're going to uh, start to wrap up the course with uh, a keynote by uh, JJ Allaire. We're really excited. So, so far we've all been using our studio in our presentations, examples, and uh, um, here we have the founder and CEO of our studio himself to talk to us about machine learning and TensorFlow. I'm very excited to introduce uh, JJ Allaire to uh, close our keynote. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, today I'm going to talk about machine learning with TensorFlow and R. And for those of you who haven't heard of TensorFlow, it's, a, it's an open source project from Google. It came out about two and a half years ago. And uh, from the time that uh, TensorFlow was released, I've been very excited about what we could do with TensorFlow from R. And uh, I spent about the last year and a half working with some folks at our studio building R interfaces to TensorFlow. So today I want to kind of walk you through that work. But before that, as kind of groundwork, talk a little bit about what is TensorFlow, uh, what is deep learning. Deep learning is kind of the, it's not the exclusive application of TensorFlow, but it's probably the principal one. So we'll talk a little <laughs> bit about that uh, and what, what's useful about it, what's not useful about it, um, what the potential applications of it are. And then we'll get into the work we've done to bring TensorFlow uh, interfaces to R. So first, a little bit of background on TensorFlow. And if, if you ask most people what TensorFlow is, they would say uh, it's it's they might say it's a deep learning library from Google, or they might say it's a machine learning library from Google. But it's important to recognize that it's actually broader than that. It, TensorFlow is a general purpose numerical c computing library, uh, and we have, have a long history in R of making really lovely interfaces to um, to numerical computing libraries. This one's kind of has some interesting distinguishing distinguishing characteristics, though. One of which is that um, it's a hardware independent library. So when you write a TensorFlow program or a TensorFlow script, it can actually run on all different types of hardware. It can run on, on the CPU and use all the cores uh, and use SIMD vectorized instructions on CPUs, but it can also run on GPUs. Uh, it can run on a thing called a TPU, which is something that Google, um, a piece of custom hardware that Google has made for running TensorFlow programs. So um, it's hardware independent. So when you write these programs, they take, they take maximal advantage of current hardware, and then they can actually potentially run on other types of specialized hardware as they're developed. Um, it supports automatic differentiation, which is used quite a bit in the, um, in the deep learning interfaces. And then kind of very notably, TensorFlow is built from the ground up to handle very, very large data sets, to handle distributed execution. It's kind of built for scalability and for deployment. So that's kind of what TensorFlow is. Why should we care about it? I think everything I just talked about, with we've got a new general purpose numerical computing library that's very scalable. That's interesting. Um, another interesting piece I alluded to in the last slide was that the optimization algorithms that are used in TensorFlow don't require that all the data is in RAM, so they're built to work with streaming data sets. Um, uh, and um, also notably, when you deploy a TensorFlow model, a lot of times when our users or Python users go to deploy a model, it's problematic because uh, when they put a model in production, they don't want to bring R or Python along with it. Um, with TensorFlow, you actually uh, build a uh, s sort of um, language independent representation of your model and then you can deploy with the C++ runtime. So um, lots of interesting things going on and, and there's lots of interesting things I think we can do from R with TensorFlow. So before I get into talking about deep learning, which is probably the main thing that people do with TensorFlow right now, I, I just want to set a baseline of kind of what is TensorFlow, what are tensors, what's flowing, how does it work, uh, just so you have that foundation before we talk about more about deep learning. So tensors are actually something you're all quite familiar with. They're really just multi-dimensional arrays. And so when you're working in R, you're pretty much uh, always working with tensors. Um, the most familiar of which is probably the 1D tensor, which is a vector in R. There's also 2D tensors, which are matrices. R actually supports higher dimension arrays, as many dimensions as you, as you like, 3D and 4D. And then there's a 0D tensor, which is a scalar, which R doesn't actually have a scalar, but you can think of it conceptually as a vector that is always of length one. So tensors are something you already work with and are already familiar with if you, if you, um, if you program with R. So again, some examples. Vector data is basically like a data frame or a matrix. That's a 2D tensor. Um, time series data, images, and video. You'll notice the first dimension of the tensor, just like with the data frame, the first dimension is rows, which are observations. There's always an observations dimension. And then the subsequent dimensions are the actual data. 
So um, as I alluded to before, a data frame or a matri matri matrix is a 2D tensor. Um, uh, sequence data or time series data is an example of a 3D tensor because you can, even though a time series object in R is represented as in two, two dimensions, you're also considering the sequence of samples as an observation. So the observation is, is the time steps, the features, and then, um, and then a groupings of samples. So you can see how, um, how observations and variables change as the sequences go on. Uh, images are 4D tensors. You, you think of an image usually as having height, width, and depth, or color channels, red, green, and blue. Uh, they're 4D because you have those three dimensions, and then again you have the samples dimension. So that, that turns the, a 3D data structure in, into a 4D tensor. Um, videos are 5D because in a video is really just a sequence. A, a video is really just a sequence of images. Okay, so what is the flow part of this? Uh, TensorFlow uh, programs are different than R or Python scripts that you might write um, in that you, you actually are creating a graph. Uh, and the tensors flow through the graph. So the tensors are the data. The graph is a bunch of operations. And the operations are things like matrix multiplications or adding a bias term or taking gradients. So they're, they're, those are the mathematical uh, operations that happen to the data. And so a TensorFlow program is basically a graph. That, that tensors flow through. But how do you, so how do you author one of these graphs? Well, you can um, think about authoring it at a really, really low level, but in, typically you don't. And this is, I'll explain this program a little bit more later. This is a TensorFlow deep learning model for um, recognizing handwritten digits. And here you're expressing the program or the model in very, very high level terms. And then the graph is kind of imputed from that. And that's typically how you work. So the graph is there underneath the work you do. You actually can program the graph explicitly if you want. But typically, you, you deal with things at this higher level. So what's the point of this data flow graph? Why do we do this? Um, well, you can think about some other. It's really what you're doing is you're taking a, a, an R script and you're creating an intermediate representation of the of this computation. And in R, we do we have other times where we, we create intermediate representations. Um, if you have worked with Shiny applications, in Shiny applications, you create inputs, outputs, and reactives. And what you're really doing in the Shiny application is you're building a graph of how data is going to flow through your user interface. And then Shiny kind of executes the graph, kind of doing the minimal amount of work required for, for any given user input or action. Um, if you use dplyr to work with like a remote SQL database, dplyr is creating a SQL intermediate representation, which is then run through a SQL optimizer and, um, and can then run very, very fast. So the whole idea behind this graph is that we're going to create this intermediate representation of your model or your program, and then we can run it very fast. So we can run it in parallel, not just across multiple cores, but across multiple machines. Um, since we, we're not just dealing with a, a text description of a program, we're actually dealing with the graph, the, the TensorFlow kind of runtime can, can fuse operations together and compile the graph to run faster. And as I alluded to before, this is now, your model is now a program that's independent of R, independent of Python. It can just be deployed against a C++ runtime. So that's kind of what TensorFlow is. What people are doing with TensorFlow, well, again, there's a lot of deep learning applications, and that means there's a lot of perceptual things. There's a lot of uh, computer vision. There's a lot of um, text classification and natural language processing. Um, there, there's also um, efforts to use um, TensorFlow with like time series data. So I'll go into these uh, in more detail later on. Uh, but we have this gallery of examples that are actually, these are all things we've coded in R and, and written up in detail. So um, those are some of the things people are doing with it. I wanted to get back to this point of TensorFlow being a, a generic numerical computing platform because there's a, one project that people have already uh, built on top of TensorFlow with R that has nothing to do with deep learning. Uh, it's a project called Greta. And if you're familiar with um, Stan or uh, Bugs, uh, the idea behind Greta is that you write a statistical model and fit them with MCMC. Um, and Greta has a little bit different approach in that you basically write R code to define your statistical model. That's just regular R code. Um, as by comparison, the bug system or the stand system both have you sort of write in another special scripting language. So in, in uh, Greta, you define a statistical model in R, and then you fit the model. Um, it turns that into a TensorFlow graph. 
and then you can, can kind of train and deploy the model using TensorFlow. So now your, your um, our statistical model can be trained in parallel, can be trained on GPU, can be trained on huge amounts of data, can be deployed. Um, so that's a, that's a project that, again, has nothing to do with deep learning and machine learning, but it's more um, saying, hey, there's all this numerical computing infrastructure. Can we make this, um, this statistical model system? And that's called the Greta Project. So, and I, I expect we'll see other uses of TensorFlow that are not directly tied to deep learning and machine learning uh, going <laughs> forward. OK, so let's talk a little bit about deep learning um, and what's it useful for, what, why should we as our users care about it, and kind of how does it actually work? Um, and I want to thank Francois Cholet. He's the creator of a library called Keras, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, and he has a book, Deep Learning with R. And a lot of this conceptual explanation is really from chapter one of his book. So if you're interested in this, that book's a good, a good next, next step. So super high level, what is deep learning? Um, deep learning is really taking um, input data or observations and turning them into output data. Um, or predictions. So it's input to output, observations to predictions, and it does this by progressively transforming the data through a set of layers. And each time it transforms the data, it gets the data closer and closer to the domain of output that we're looking for, which is a prediction. This example is, that's a, hand, a black and white, the grayscale image of a handwritten digit. And the, this task is we're going to feed these grayscale images to the model and we're going to try to predict what they are. Uh, this is actually a data set that the uh, post office um, put together in the 70s. It's been used in machine learning kind of research and teaching for a long time. So let's talk about these layers and how this, how this works. What are these layers? Well, the layers are really, uh, I, I'm not going to actually explain all the mechanics of neural networks and how they work. It's most important at a really, really high level. You can think of a layer as a data transformation function. So we're going to transform the data. And each layer is parameterized by a set of weights, or you can think of them as weights or parameters or coefficients. So every time we, we uh, move data through the layers, we have to figure out how to do it, and, and how to do it is determined by the weights. Okay. So when I say transforming data to different representations, obviously what we really want is we want to go from an image to prediction. But we need to, to modify the data so it gets closer to the prediction domain. So what does that mean? This is a really, really simplified example. Here's some raw data, um, X, and y, uh, <coughs> X and Y data. And the task here is to predict whether the, a given point will be white or black. And so by changing the coordinate system and rotating it, you can see the prediction task has become very easy. If X is greater than uh, 0, it's a black point. If, if uh, X is less than zero, <clears throat> it's a white point. So that's really oversimplified, but that should get to this idea of transforming the data in a way that is more useful than the original representation. You can think of this if you do machine learning. Typically, this is called feature engineering, where you're going to transform your inputs into a data that's more useful for, the, for, for modeling and for machine learning algorithms. One difference in deep learning is that rather than hand coding the feature engineering, they're learned. They're learned. So the feature engineering basically happens. The data that you give to the model is more raw, and then the feature engineering happens and is learned by the layers of the model. So going, going back to our grayscale image example, as we transform the data, we're, we, we, it's less interesting what the image looks like. It's more interesting to figure out, are there, um, <clears throat> are there uh, edges? What's the angle of the edges? Are there shadows? Where are the edges and shadows located? These are the kind of things that actually help uh, generate the prediction. So you can see that uh, in this case, it's a convolutional network, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. The data is going to get distilled. It's going to get transformed. And as you can see, as it gets to the third layer, it's looking a lot more like uh, the, closer to the prediction domain than it is at the beginning. So that's how these models work. And what, the way that the data is being transformed is not something that you prescribe too terribly much. It's, it's learned by the model, typically. So this is where the term deep and deep learning comes from. It's not that it's deeper insights or deeper models or better models. It's that we are using layers. It's deep. There's many, many layers. Typically, machine learning would have one or two layers of representation. Deep learning models can have dozens or even hundreds of layers of representation. So 
a more appropriate name for the field might be layered representation learning or hierarchical representation learning or something like that. But deep is short and catchy, so that's what people call it now. Um, so what has this technique achieved? It's achieved really, really, really impressive results in perceptual tasks especially. So computer vision, um, speech recognition, machine translation, uh, some t uh, natural language processing tasks. Um, there are re reinforcement learning applications uh, that allow these models to learn how to play games. Um, so some of these things have been composed together to do things like uh, build autonomous driving systems. And it's really a, a pretty simple mechanism that's going on. Um, and it's, and, and it's, it's able to w do these really impressive things. And so the question is why? And one way to get intuition about that is you think about uh, uncrumpling a paper ball. And if you tried to like write down an equation for uncrumpling the paper ball, it would be really difficult. But if you think about how a person would uncrumple a paper ball, they're going to do 30 or 40 successive simple transformations pulling the ball apart. And at the end, it's done. It's a flat piece of paper. So really, you, you can think of these deep learning models as learning these several dozen simpler transformations that get them to a much more complex transformation or able to learn a much more complex function. So why is it? Why should our users care about this? In some ways, the, the areas that um, deep learning has been successful in are not, um, not the principal things that our users do, things like computer vision and speech recognition, reinforcement learning. So at one level, um, it's cool that now in R we can actually do state-of-the-art computer vision uh, and state-of-the-art um, speech recognition and things like that. So that's useful. But I think it's probably more interesting to think about our, uh, the domains of data that we analyze traditionally. Do they have, um, are they really difficult to um, do feature engineering, feature engineering for? Could we, could we find better ways to, to do feature engineering with our existing data analysis with deep learning? Or um, does our data have really complex spatial and sequence dependencies that traditional models don't capture well? So that's, I think, some of the questions for our users to ask. I think it's important before we talk further to point out that it is definitely proven to be really good and even state of the art at these perceptual tasks, but it's, there are, it's not yet proven to be of widespread benefit in, in other domains. I think there's a lot of research going on. There's a lot of people who are excited about the possibilities, but it's still in the, in the proving ground, I would say. So um, one more bit about deep learning, um, which is kind of how these models actually get trained. Um, and I'll kind of take you through, uh, using this MNIST example again, um, what, the, what the basic mechanism for training these models is. And I think you'll see further from this that it is really a very simple and straightforward mechanism that's, that's going on here. Um, one note going into it, you'll, you'll notice as we go further in the discussion that the models that you create with deep learning essentially are not interpretable. They don't have any explanatory power. They're black boxes. And then statistical modeling is often focused on trying to actually explain or understand or infer the process by which data is generated. So this is, in a way, th these techniques are sort of uh, different culturally than the kind of techniques that we traditionally use in, st in statistical modeling. So I'll leave a link to this deck uh, when the talk is done. And if you're interested in kind of reading up on that, um, this, you can find this slide and, and look at some of, these, some of these articles. So let's go back to this um, model for learning how to recognize handwritten digits. This is actually a, an a R Keras model for learning how to recognize handwritten digits. That's the, what the R code looks like. And here we're basically saying, here's a bunch of layers. Here's the definition of the, which type of layers do I want to use, and what are the attributes of those layers. And that essentially gets turned into this model where we try to, each layer has a whole bunch of coefficients or weights <laughs> to try to get it to work well, and we're trying to learn those by training the model. So how does that work? When we, when we start out, here, here again, we have layers and we're trying to learn the weights. Once we've learned good weights, the model will actually work well. When we start out, we actually initialize the weights randomly. So when the model begins, they're randomly initialized. When you put an input in, you, do, you get an incorrect, or if it's correct, it's only by luck, prediction. So the model starts off not really being able to do anything. It's just we just, so we feed batches through, through the training process, see what the predictions are. And we, of course, since it's training data, we know what the true targets are. So we take the predictions and we compare them to the true targets using a loss function. Okay? And different, different uh, models are better trained with different types of loss functions. 
So we have sort of a score of how good the prediction was. And then we use an optimizer to take that score and, and feed that back to update the weights. So this is the basic mechanic, feeding thousands and thousands of batches of data through, evaluating uh, the model's predictions based on a loss function, and then tweaking the weights just ever so little bit to see if we can get a better model. And then at the end of the model, hopefully it has converged to have good predictive power. So that's the basic mechanic of how it works. Uh, and I think this is from Francois Cholet, who's, again, the creator of Keras, which is probably the most popular deep learning library. And he's pointing out that these, these are not neural, they're not networks, they're not even mathematically that complicated. Um, it's just we figured out how to scale these up and do these really impressive things. But they're, they're not a really, really complex thing. They're actually a really simple thing. Um, so um, we've taken this simple mechanism and we've scaled it up. Uh, to be able to uncrumple these very, very large, you know, manifolds of data or paper balls. Um, and um, the, one of the interesting things, interesting things about this is that the ideas behind neural networks uh, were originated decades ago. So uh, more or less, we knew about this technique a long time ago. Um, but it wasn't really useful for practical tasks that people cared about. So, so some things did change. So one, uh, in one, on the one hand, there were some algorithmic advances that caused, that allowed people to train larger models. But most importantly, um, we got hardware in the form of GPUs that could train very, very, very large models. And we got data sets, which were very, very, very large because of the internet and sort of the digitization of many, many uh, things in our society. Um, so... Lots more data, lots bigger models, some algorithmic advances, and all of a sudden we're doing state-of-the-art computer vision, whereas 30 or 40 years ago we weren't doing very much useful at all. So what do I mean by sufficiently large parametric models? This model is the grayscale digit recognizer, and uh, this is a printout of the model in R, and it has 1.2 million parameters or coefficients. So that is not a... not as super complicated task actually the handwritten digit recognition think about that grayscale handwritten digit recognition trying to recognize 10 classes compare that to say looking at color images where you're trying to recognize like 4,000 classes where it could be a cat a dog a table a chair a car a house that's a much more difficult task and we have models that do that those models here's one of them have 138 million parameters and there was trained they were trained on 14 million images so this is, when we talk about these models not being interpretable, you have a model that has 138 million coefficients. It's, you're not really going to be able to look at those coefficients and gain any understanding about the phenomena. So, so these models that often have it in the, in the many, many millions of parameters. And those models are now big enough that they work well for the kind of tasks that we want to throw at them. So what's happened in deep learning in the last few years is that we've, we've, we've explored and are creating frontiers. Uh, in different disciplines, um, and, and deep learning works well or not, in you know, in vari at varying levels in all these different um, disciplines. So, computer vision, as I've alluded to before, is kind of the poster child for deep learning success. This is really interesting. There's a there's a contest called the ImageNet Challenge, uh, which is an annual competition that machine learning uh, researchers enter, and they have. 3.2 million labeled images in 5,000 categories, and they have to identify them. And when the contest started in 2010, the best teams were in the low 70s. I think they were around 72% accuracy on this task. And then in 2012, the first team that ever used deep learning entered the competition and beat the field by 10.8%. And that was kind of a wake-up call to everyone. Wow, this stuff actually works. Um, and subsequent to that, Everybody started using deep learning, and now in 2017, the winning teams at 97.3%. They're actually going to uh, not have this competition anymore because it's kind of considered a solved problem. Uh, and <laughs> and but really interesting. In seven years, we went from 72 to 97%. That's that's absolutely stunning. So, computer vision, deep learning, it works great. And for, for if your task fits well into that. Um, then you probably have some really, really great wins you can, you can rack up with deep learning. So natural language processing, another field. Um, there has, there's a lot of, uh, if you look at these are um, papers in computational linguistics conferences. 
they were about, and over the same time period, went from around 35% to 70% of them doing deep learning. Um, th this field, the NLP, has not been transformed by deep learning, but there's definitely promising work that's happening in different sorts of things. This paper actually is sort of a roundup. It's a, only a several month old paper that's kind of a roundup of everything that's happening in NLP with deep learning. It might be worth looking at. Um, one specific part of NLP, which is language translation, Google rolled out this neural, neural machine translation system, uh, I think it was somewhere a year or two ago, and they replaced their previous phrase-based translation system with this neural system, and you can see it got huge improvements, and in some pairings of languages, it's getting very close to human-level human level translation. So that's a, that's a huge win for deep learning. Um, there are people working on using deep learning for time series. This paper looks at using convolutional neural networks, which are typically the networks that are used to do, um, to, to do computer vision, looking at time series with convolutional networks. Um, and then there's another paper that uses a totally different method, methodology called a stacked autoencoder auto -encoder to do securities forecasting. So again, if you, if you're, if you talk to a time series practitioner, uh, they'll probably say, yeah, I've, 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 tr I've played with deep learning. I haven't been able to get it to work better than you know, what I'm already doing now, but I know, I know people have. So I think t time series is very much in that kind of early frontier where people are trying to figure out what, what sorts of problems are better solved by deep learning models compared to traditional methods. Uh, in biomedical field, um, there's a lot of activity going on. This is a paper that came out recently as well that kind of rounds up things that are going on in biomedical and people are looking at doing things like patient classification, they're doing you know, fun research in fundamental biological processes. So there's a lot of early work going on in biomedical. Again, it hasn't changed the field fundamentally, but it probably will in some, in some uh, parts of, of, of biomedical data analysis. Um, this is a very interesting um, project that touches on the biomedical, that uh, this paper was released in January of 2018 um, by, it was done by Google, University of California San, Francisco, California, San Francisco, Stanford, and the U of Chicago School of Medicine. And they are looking at analyzing electronic health records. And electronic health records are like the like patient history data. They're very messy. The, there's, the, the data is inconsistently collected. It's not well normalized. These records are kind of kind of a mess. And so what usually happens is that statisticians or machine learning folks will do a lot of feature engineering. They'll, they'll select a subset of features. They'll try to impute values. You know, they'll, they'll do a lot of work so that they can basically get the data to a point where they can run a classical statistical model against it. And what this approach did was something different. They said, well, when we do all that cleaning and culling uh, and normalizing, we're actually throwing away a huge amount of data. What if we try to build a model that looked at the entire electronic medical record, totally unnormalized, missing data and all, that also looked at like physicians' handwritten notes, and see if that could, could have better efficacy of prediction. And in some cases, they found that it actually did. So this is a totally different approach to, to prediction uh, that you wouldn't normally think of, because you normally think, well, we have to get the data to, into a shape and form when, when our, when our, where our statistical methods will actually be valid. Here they're 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 saying well the the, the model is going to invent some new some new methods for analyzing the data it'll it will do the feature engineering it will somehow find a way to cull the data down so that it gets better better predictive efficacy so that's a really interesting study to pay attention to um, as I've kind of alluded to a little bit already that there are um, quite a few problems with deep learning models one of them is that they're not interpretable so they don't they don't give you any uh, insight into what into the underlying phenomena. They just give you predictions. Um, they can be brittle. If you Google adversarial examples, you'll find like an example of like two, a picture of two panda bear pictures, and a human would look at them and say they're both panda bears, but the one of them has been doctored very subtly to trick an image classifier into thinking it's not a panda bear. So you know, a human being obviously something way more complicated is going on when a human being looks at those pictures. It can it has no doubt that they're both panda bears, but the computer is kind of easily tricked. Um, they do typically require a large amount of data to work well, and they oftentimes are very expensive to train. So a lot of times, you know, like a gradient boosted tree will work better than a deep learning model on a smaller amount of data, or even on a larger amount of data, it might it might take a lot less time to train and give you a similar result. 
So, um, so these are some things to keep in mind. There are actually ways to get deep learning models to work with small data sets, which I'll, I'll allude to in a few, in a few slides. Um, so there's a lot of hype about deep learning as well. And as you'll, I think, see when you look at the tools we have for R and you look at the tools that are available now, Keras for Python as well, it's very, very easy to create deep learning models. You can actually create these models without knowing anything about modeling or statistics. <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of people, uh, in some cases like software engineers, will say, I'm going, to, I'm going to do modeling, I'm going to use deep learning because that's hot. And they'll make a model, and it'll be a model that yields predictions, but it'll be way worse predictively than a, than a classical statistical model, and it'll be way more expensive to train. So we're going to deal with this, unfortunately, because we are going to have a whole bunch of people getting into modeling and machine learning who don't have, don't have training. And I think our job is not to say, don't ever use deep learning. It's more to have a more balanced dialogue about what are the strengths and weaknesses of these methods, because they, there are very useful things you can do. Um, Google has, inside Google, they've tracked kind of the uh, TensorFlow model files in internal uh, version control repositories, and it's absolutely skyrocketed since they introduced TensorFlow a couple years ago. So there's lots of good uses. There's a lot of uses, a lot of places that will be misapplied. Um, so as statisticians, part of our role is to help have that good dialogue about where does this make sense and where does it not make sense. So now I want to talk a little bit about the work we've done to bring R to, uh, to bring TensorFlow to R, to create R interfaces for TensorFlow. We've got lots of different high-level interfaces. We've got some lower-level interfaces. We've got some tools to help with workflow, different ways to get access to GPUs for training, and, uh, and quite a few uh, educational resources. So let's talk about that a little bit. So there's, there's actually three top-level APIs for, for R, to, for, to, to TensorFlow for R. One is the Keras API, which is what we're going to mostly talk about today, which is a high-level interface for building neural nets. There's also an estimator API, which works much more like classical uh, statistical modeling functions or, st or machine learning functions, more like, like scikit-learn. Um, and then there's uh, the core API, which is actually interacting directly with the TensorFlow graph. And that's really for like package builders, tool builders, not really so much for, for end users. Or maybe for end users who are doing, who are doing novel research in some cases. So this, this ends up um, kind of factoring out into currently seven different R packages. There's the three interfaces we talked about. There's a package for dealing with large data sets. And then there's supporting tools for workflow and deployment. So talk a little bit about some of these. Um, again, the Keras API, this high-level neural networks API, that's what I'm going to go into the most detail about in a moment. This is that, uh, that uh, image classification model that we looked at earlier. Um, TensorFlow estimators. These look more like classical, again, statistical modeling functions. There's like linear regressor, linear classifier. Um, there's there's a S support vector machine. There's boosted trees. So these are kind of not authoring a neural network by layer, but more just using TensorFlow to do these classical machine learning tasks. And then the core API, you actually program the, the TensorFlow graph directly. So I'm not going to talk about estimators or the core API much after this, but it's just important to know that they're that they're available. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Keras. And first, um, why Keras? Um, uh, there, there were quite a few different deep learning frameworks. Um, you can see starting in 2014, there were these original ones, Theano, Cafe, and Torch. Uh, and as the, over the last two or three years, TensorFlow and Keras, Keras which actually is, can be an interface to TensorFlow, have really, really kind of run away with, with, with things. Um, there's, there are always going to be competitors, but they're sort of today the most dominant way to, to, for practitioners. Um, but I think it's also noteworthy that if you look here, they, these are research papers published on the archive website. And, you know, um, TensorFlow has the most, but Keras has quite a large share of research papers. And that's, it's noteworthy to me that a, that a framework that's known for ease of learning, ease of use, and productivity is also flexible enough to be used uh, by people doing doing research. So that's why we focused on Keras. And actually Google is very much focusing on Keras as kind of the recommended recommended interface for, for building neural nets with, with TensorFlow. So, so let's take a look at a, a kind of a Keras uh, program. I won't talk about it line by line, but I'll kind of talk more categorically. If we're going to build a model that's going to transform these, um, trans, tra going to do predictions, um, on handwritten digits, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to 
get the images, and we're going to turn them into tensors. So in all, almost every time you build a model, there's going to be you're going to get data from CSV files or images or sound files or text, you know, text documents, and you're going to do some transformations on the data to get them get them into tensors or in often cases these will be like matrices, R matrices, uh, and then you'll define your model. And in in this case, you'll, um, you'll you're you're defining a set of layers. Um, Almost all the work of building a deep learning model is in figuring out what the what these layers are supposed to be and what their what their properties are supposed to be. You know, for a non-trivial deep learning task, you probably try out hundreds of different model architectures. So even though the ultimate expression of it is just a few lines of code, the work is all in figuring out which lines which lines are supposed to be there. Um, so once you've um, define the model, then you compile the model, and that's where we specify what loss function we want to use, what optimizer we want to use. Different tasks have uh, worked better, or work better with different loss functions and optimizers, and then which metrics we want to collect. I want to make one side note here. If you look at this line of code, it's probably a little bit surprising for people who've used R because R has by value semantics. Typically, with R. If you want to modify an object, you pass a copy of it to a function, and then the function returns a copy of it. Here, we're not doing that. We're actually modifying the model in place. And that is because the underlying library uh, has a model object that is, in fact, stateful. Um, it's an acyclic graph of layers, directed acyclic graph of layers. Their state is updated during training. Layers are actually... A layer can exist at, I haven't shown this, but it can exist at multiple different places within the model, and when it changes in one, it has to change in the other. So um, in this case, we modify the model object in place. So I just wanted to, that's a little different from what we typically see in R, but that's how the underlying Keras library works. And then we train the model. So here we pass, we say, we say fit, we pass uh, the training data uh, <coughs> to the model. We say how, how many observations at a time do we want to draw from the training data? How many times do we want to traverse the, the training data set? And then we say there's, some amount of data that we want to hold out from the model because a, a, if a deep learning model is large enough, it can essentially like memorize the data. So you, what you really want to do is as you're training it, you want to hold out data and then uh, and evaluate the model against data that it has never seen before. So in this case, it's going to, with each epoch, it's going to hold out a random 20% of the data. And at the end of the epoch, it's going to look and see how did, how did, how's our model doing against that data that we haven't seen before. And then as you can see, we return a history object from FIT. And we can plot our history, and there, and there we can see this is like the best case where your uh, training metrics uh, are, are the same as your validation metrics. So the model, it's always going to do well on the training data, but will it do well? Will it generalize? Will it do well on data that it's never seen before? And that's the validation. In this case, we're tracking training and validation. More often than not, when you're starting to build a model, your validation data will get worse. The loss will get worse. The accuracy will get worse. And you have, then you have to figure out, how can I get a model that, that, that generalizes well to validation data? But this is like what a good model looks like. Uh, and then we can uh, further evaluate the model against yet other uh, sets of data that we've set aside that the model hasn't seen before. And we can generate uh, predictions. So let me just show you quickly kind of what that looks like. It's the same script in our studio. Um, we'll first do these. The, the um, MNIST data set is actually built into Keras, so we go grab the data set, and then we do a bunch of transformations on the data, and we end up with four matrices, and those matrices are, are going to be what we feed into the model, uh, and then we're going to define the model, compile the model, we can print the summary, sort of we've seen that before, it tells us what the layers are and how many parameters it has. This is a little bit less sophisticated model than the one we had earlier, so it only has 235 thousand parameters, and then we fit the model. And um, as you're fitting the model, we show you the, the uh, training and validation metrics in real time in our studio. This is useful because most of the time your model is not going to be converging like this. The, it's going to, as you know, it gets on in epochs, it's going to be getting worse, and you're going to want to interrupt it and do something else. So you, get, you see that real time view of the model, uh, and you get the same sort of view by plotting the model evaluate it, and generate predictions. So that's the same script and kind of, it's a short script, and a lot of deep learning models will have pretty short scripts, but it, it takes a huge amount of time to get to what, you know, what's the right, um, what's the right script or the right model architecture for a given prediction task. 
Um, talking a little bit more about layers, um, there are actually 65 different layers in Keras. They all get added to a model with these layer functions. And again, I'll talk categorically about a few, a few different types of layers that there are, but uh, I won't talk in detail about all, all these 65. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, on Macs, so you need you need an NVIDIA GPU, and Macs don't do, don't 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 have the NVIDIA GPUs built in. So if I had a Linux machine or a Windows machine that had a GPU, it would use it. Yeah. It's not too bad. Um, you you um, it, there's instructions for doing it. it. Is on the order of like run an installer, set a couple environment variables. That so not it's not like one button happiness. But it's, you know, cl close enough. Um, if, you don't have, if, you don't, if you don't have a laptop with a GPU, oftentimes laptops also don't have, like, high-performance NVIDIA GPUs because they draw a lot of power. There's a lot of ways to use, like, cloud GPUs, which I'll get into a little bit, a little bit later on. Okay, so dense layers are kind of the classic neural network layers that, you know, the neural networks that people were exploring in the 70s had these dense layers. And they're really just multiplying the inputs times this um, <clears throat> times the weights matrix and adding a bias. This is a really classic dense layer. And m most models, even if they use more sophisticated layers, will have the dense layers uh, at the bottom. So the, the, the final part of the model will be dense layers. I should also say there's this activation function. That's a typical um, kernel multiplication. But this activation function introduces nonlinearity. Non so, for example, you might use a sigmoid function there. So, convolutional layers are what's used in computer vision. And the idea behind a convolutional layer is that we want to learn kind of location or translation invariant patterns in the data. So, if we, if we know how to find an edge, we can find it anywhere. It's not just, oh, I, there's an edge in the top right corner, there's an edge somewhere. So, basically, what happens is that these filters get built. The filters are passed over the image, and those filters then find, find basically these features. And then those, that data is then used as the input to the next layer, and then yet more, yet more filters can be applied. So these convolutional uh, layers are good when there's data that is going to be found, patterns that are going to be found throughout the, the input, uh, and you want to recognize them in a location invariant way. Again, every computer vision model uses, every, every um, Good co uh, computer vision model uses convolutional layers. Uh, recurrent layers are layers that have state, and so it's not just they don't just look at um, what the current um, set of input data is. They actually learn. They, in addition, they learn a state vector. So they they learn a vector of values that expresses the data that they've seen before. So these are used again for uh, oftentimes for sequence data, time series data, um, natural language processing data that, that where sequence matters and you need some memory sort of uh, in the model. Embedding layers, for those of you who do uh, natural language processing, you'll know what this is. The idea here is you can think of words as just classes. So you can think of there's 10,000 different words and it's like cat and dog are just two classes. But um, natural language processing has these things called embedding vectors, which say that, that there's more semantics that you want to capture about words. So you, instead of just a class, you actually each word is represented by a vector, and <clears throat> um, within that vector, there are values that capture, for example, the fact that a dog and a cat are both animals or both house pets. Um, and so these are for learning, kind of learning richer semantic representations of words. And once you have those, the model tends to work better. So you can actually learn embeddings from data jointly with training, or you can load pre-trained word embeddings. There are some. Uh, word embeddings used in natural language processing, nothing to do with deep learning, but they exist, and you can load those into an embedding layer as well. Um, all right, so you get your layers and you compile the model, and again, I, I talked about this earlier, but uh, important to know, this is kind of a step where your program gets turned into a TensorFlow graph. Um, you pick your loss and optimizer and metrics. Um, lots of different loss functions, and uh, you know, you, if you read tutorials and things online, you'll discover that different loss functions are appropriate for different types of prediction tasks. You can actually write your own loss functions, and oftentimes it's actually important to write your own loss function to get the best performing model. Um, there are optimizers, uh, a variety of different optimizers, and all of which can operate on streams of data. They don't need to see all the data. And then there's lots of different metrics for, for measuring different aspects 
of the model, and uh, as you'd expect, you can also write your own metrics. Um, all of this that I just talked about, we have a cheat sheet um, that does a much better job than I think the slides, kind of summarizing all these different different things. So if you're working with Keras, I definitely recommend picking up picking up that cheat sheet. Um, I wanted to talk through some uh, examples. Um, we actually have written up, we have this TensorFlow gallery, and the gallery ha basically has these kind of um, longer form blog posts that talk about these different kind of projects. And they're, they're more than just, you know, the kind of hello world example. They talk a little bit about the data set, the problems, things we tried that did work, didn't work, uh, intermediate data visualization of how the model is doing, things like that. So they're longer worked examples, and we'll be continuing to add to that. So I'll just touch on what, what, what you can find in, in some of those. Um, one of them actually does this thing that I alluded to before, which is called transfer learning, which is the idea that you, in this case, we've got uh, 2,000 input images, uh, and we're trying to classify whether they're a dog or a cat. So 2,000 is not that many, not that many inputs, but you can take a computer vision model that was trained on a broader set of classes, and you can actually kind of a transfer a part of that model over to this and then train your data on kind of a combination of the existing model and then some new layers that you add. Um, and so in this case, we're able to get 97% predict prediction accuracy on cats versus dogs with only 2,000 input images. So this kind of talks about how to do transfer learning. Um, there's another article that talks about different techniques for doing time series forecasting. This was a temperature prediction. There was like 14 or so features to predict temperature talks about different things you do to try to get time series models to work better. Um, there's an example of trying to, uh, it was a peptide classification problem. So the idea was they're going to do um, immunotherapy. And they're, so they're going to introduce cells to, to help treat cancerous cells. And they're trying to, the classification is to figure out how those cells are going to bind to the cells that are there. And so this example shows um, a comparison of using like a, a uh, boosted tree, no, a random forest versus versus deep learning. Um, yes? The training was, if you read this, th this was um, this guy who works at a lab in the UK, and they simulated the training data, and that and they, they, he writes up in there why that's legit, but it's, it's so they, they got a lot of training data by, by simulating it. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So there's a thing. I think Google calls it AutoML. So the idea is that the, the, the you're, you're you're doing this search over different model architectures. You could have the computer do the search, um, and so I think they have like AutoML for image classification, where you can just give it the images and it it, it presumes nothing at the beginning and it just starts making layers and um, it it's. Um, it, it can be expensive to do that, um, but I think so. AutoML, AutoML for image classification is probably like a real thing, and and for maybe these other things. But I, I think a lot of people feel like that's the future, or at least part of the future, is that we're going to be able to instead of just machine learning engineers sitting there like messing around with different architectures, they'll just have the computer uh, learn the architecture. Um, this is a, an example of trying to do credit card fraud detection. What's interesting about this is I think there's like. 200 and say, I don't remember exactly, 250,000 observations and only 400 are fraudulent. So traditional log logistic regression has trouble picking up enough signal from the only 400 fraudulent transactions. So this is another approach based on an autoencoder to see if they could get better, better predict predictive capacity. Um, this is a simple tech classification example, um, basically trying to figure out if two questions on Quora are duplicates. Um, this demonstrates both that, uh, but also how to put a shiny, shiny front end, web front end, on top of a of a Keras model. Uh, and then another um, example. This is one trying to predict customer churn, and this has a couple interesting things. Uh, one is it, it also has a shiny dashboard they put on top of the model, but um, it uses a package called Lime, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And the idea behind Lime is even though Deep learning models are not globally interpretable. You know, you have all these coefficients. They don't tell you anything about generally what's going on with, with phenomena. Uh, they are, you can make them locally interpretable. So this is actually showing for a given prediction which features contributed or did not contribute to the, to the classification. So um, 
So the idea is a lot, and a lot of, well, I'll talk more about Lyman in a minute, but the, the idea is you can make these models or any machine learning model that's a black box, you can make it locally interpretable, interpretable for a given observation. Uh, and then finally, we have um, an example of learning. This is a uh, Amazon Fine Foods reviews, I think, and learning word embeddings. I talked about the idea of these richer vector vector representations of words. And so, um, for different data sets, you might have different optimal uh, word vectorizations. Here's an example of learning word embeddings for Amazon reviews. And and just learning embeddings is then something that you could then feed to a traditional statistical model or traditional machine learning model. You're basically just saying, I have a richer set of classification data than I, than I otherwise would. Um, touching a little bit on this explainability, and um, I talked about Lyme, I'll talk about that more in a second. But there's been some work to say, okay, for uh, a model that's, it's, it's, it's a black box, but we could take an, a single prediction. Uh, in this case, this is an image that was predicted to be an African elephant. And we can basically look at some of the intermediate layers and, take, and look at their gradients and basically build a heat map that shows what parts of the image actually most contributed to the classification. And in this case, then we, we actually juxtapose the heat map over the image. And now we can re really clearly, for a given prediction, see why is it that we thought this was, or what aspects of the image made us think this was an African elephant. So we get some additional explainability for certain types of computer vision models using techniques like this. Um, Lime I just talked about, this idea of for any given prediction, we can say what features contributed to the prediction. Um, and Lime actually works with, it works with all different machine learning packages. It works with Carrot and uh, MLR and, uh, and Keras and it's, a, it's extensible. So any, any black box model you can do this local interpretation with. So kind of getting back to this idea of deep learning frontiers, um, you know, a lot of fields of inquiry have a frontier that has not been reached or approached. Um, and in a lot of cases, most cases, traditional methods work better. Um, so I think if you're in a field where there's work going on, it's, you know, you could, you could just say, I'm just going to wait and wait. I, I don't really want to waste my time trying to find deep learning models, I'll, I'll let other people do it. <laughs> Some other folks might say, well, I'm going to look at papers and research and I'll try to implement them, apply them to my data and see if I get some better results. Or there are people who are going to basically say, I want to be at, I want to be at the frontier and I'm actually going to try to do, do original research and see if I can figure out how to get these techniques to perform well on, on tasks that I care about. So, um, you know, as I alluded to before, uh, you know, deep learning, it's, it's a very iterative trying to discover these models so you do you do it does require a lot of kind of patience iteration and compute power um, so I think then kind of then um, yeah this is sort of the same the same thing you've got to figure out what's my model architecture what what are all those parameters supposed to be and it's actually quite difficult to, to figure this stuff out Typ typically I you know I've talked to some people who've gotten like really good time series models and they might spend two or three weeks to get the model. So it has to be a situation where like a better model is really, really valuable. A, a model that's 1% better or 2% better is really valuable because it's going to take a lot of time and effort to get to get these models working better than what we already know how to do. So we've built a bunch of supporting tools to kind of help with this and I'll kind of, I'll go pretty briefly through these just to give you an idea of what's out there and you can, you can use our website to find out more. Um, there are tools for using GPUs. So uh, you can, as I alluded to, if you have a, a, a local NVIDIA GPU, uh, it's reasonably easy to get that configured and working with TensorFlow and, and the R interface to TensorFlow. There are, there's like uh, cloud batch processing services that you can send jobs off to. Um, there are, you can use Amazon and get, use like RStudio server on an Amazon instance with a GPU. Or there's even a way to, um, to actually have a cloud, a Linux desktop in the cloud that you run through a web browser that has a, that has a GPU. So we have... Uh, on our website, at that URL, kind of more detailed information about doing all these things. Um, and I'll talk about CloudML in a minute. But we also have this package called TF Runs, which is, is it's sort of for what we call experiment management. And the idea is every time you, make, you, you change something about your hyperparameters, your source code, or anything, you do a training run and you see how it went. So the idea is instead of taking your script and sourcing it, you call training run on it. And when you call training run on it, Essentially, that run and everything about it, including the source code, the hyperparameters, the results, all get recorded. So now at the end of doing hundreds and hundreds of runs, you actually have a data frame representing all those runs, which you can compute on to kind of learn more about what works well and what doesn't work well. 
There's also a, a way to get a for any given run, you can get a report that shows you that metrics graph, shows you kind of all the all the, all the hyperparameters you use. Actually, if you, you can actually see the code if you want. Um, if you have two runs and you want to compare them, you can take a look at what was different between the runs and you know, what, what the source code what was, what was different in source code, what was different in results. So this is, TF runs is really kind of I'd say it's workflow and experiment management. I think if you're really going to do deep learning, you, you need to use a tool like this to um, to kind of help manage all, all that trial and error. Um, you can use flags to sort of externalize parameters. These are parameters I know that I'm going to want to experiment with, so I'll make them flags, and then it's going to be very easy to pass those flags to the training run command. And then more interestingly, you can pass a grid. You can basically do a grid search uh, or a sampled grid search that says, okay, here's all the hyperparameters I care about. Try every uh, combination of these parameters, and then tell me what the best model was. So there's, that's the idea of a tuning run. Um, I mentioned CloudML. CloudML is basically a batch service for submitting models to, to um, train on the cloud. And they have GPUs. They have all different types of GPUs. In fact, yeah, this is the idea. Is you don't want to build that at home. You just, Google builds that, and then you can submit jobs. And uh, it's, it's really as straightforward as just saying CloudML train, and it'll take your script. It'll take whatever's in the working directory, it'll send it up, it'll figure out what packages need to be installed, it'll install them, and it'll run your training script uh, on the cloud. Um, you can actually say, I want to use a GPU, it's CPU by default, but you can say GPU, or you can say, I want to like even faster GPU that's more expensive, but faster. So that's interesting, and then you can do, you can use kind of the TF runs functionality of collecting jobs um, that you've done. So when, when a job runs in the cloud, you still get a nice report about what happened. Uh, you can list the runs. Um, and then they have a service for hyperparameter tuning that basically says, Google, I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell you, here's the parameters I care about, here's the ranges, run no more than 10 trials, go figure out what, what works best. So this is really great because instead of your machine crunching while doing a grid search, Google, you can say, okay, run, run 1,000 jobs and use your Bayesian optimizer to figure out, you know, to minimize the number of jobs that I have to run to get to the right answer. And at the end, you get a report saying these are the hyperparameters that work best. So this sort of thing is, as I said, is essential for doing deep learning successfully. Uh, OK. Um, OK, I'm going to go really quickly over this. Th we've got some tools for deployment. I talked about this idea that you don't, when you deploy a TensorFlow model, you don't need to bring R or Python along with it. You can just save it into a format that can be served by a, by a C++ runtime. Um, so we have tools to export saved models and then s kind of serve, put an HTTP interface on top of a saved model. Uh, there's TensorFlow. Serving is an open source project that Google has for, for serving these models. Uh, we have a product called Our Studio Connect that serves the models. CloudML can serve the models. So this gets to this idea of, you know, you've built this generic um, intermediate format for models and they can be served efficiently from lots and lots of different places. Um, you can build shiny front ends for models. Uh, this is really interesting, and this is something that Google has invested in quite a, quite a bit in the last couple, three months, or at least they've announced a lot of work in the last couple, three months. Once you've got these models, then again, they're, they're not tied to programming language. You can actually um, deploy them onto mobile devices. You can deploy them into uh, web browsers. So um, th these models, can you can think of like a computer vision model that can go on a phone, take a picture, and then run the model against the phone all local. That's pretty cool. Um, so that's, uh, that's also possible. Um, so I think kind of the, the highest level, I, I want everyone to understand TensorFlow does a lot for deep learning, but there's actually quite a few other applications of it, like Greta, uh, like classical machine learning, and hopefully we'll, we'll discover more as the years go on. Um, deep learning has made a lot of progress in some fields, and it's probably going to increase in importance in other fields, not really known exactly how and when yet. And uh, probably most importantly, R now has the state-of-the-art um, tooling for deep learning. Keras and TensorFlow are the most popular frameworks, and we have a really nice uh, native R interface to the complete APIs of both of those, of those libraries. Um, everything I talked about is available more in more depth and detail on the TensorFlow for R website. Um, and I would recommend if you're interested in this, I'd recommend two books. Um, they're very different. Um, one of them, Deep Learning with R, is by Francois, who's the creator of Keras. Uh, and this is a book that um, it's, it has a lot. It has a lot of conceptual material, 
like I said, all the stuff that I, the conceptual stuff I did is all from chapter one. And he goes into all these different, you know, convolutional models and recurrent models and the concepts behind them. Has lots of really great illustrations. But, and then he's got a lot of R code. So it's very, it's very good conceptually, but also really good at a practical level. Um, there's actually no math in this book. It's just code. Um, so all the intuition for even mathematical ideas are provided by, by showing code. Uh, and then deep learning, uh, this is probably the leading conceptual book in the field. Uh, and this book goes through all the concepts. It has no code at all. It's only math. So depending on how you learn, what you prefer, you could read one or the other first or only one or the other. But these, I think, are the two most important books to read if you want to learn more. Um, so that is what I have. To talk about TensorFlow, the slides are here, and I will um, keep this up during Q and A, so you can, uh, so people can get, um, make sure they can get access to that. And we have a blog where, when we announce new packages or new gallery articles, we post to that blog. So, um, so if you're interested, that's worth worth subscribing to as well. Um, I have a little bit. Um, Kylie asked me to talk a little bit about a package called Reticulate, which is kind of underneath. Uh, the TensorFlow package, but maybe I'll start with a little Q&A about TensorFlow, see what time it is. Yeah, maybe we can do a little bit of Q&A about TensorFlow and then um, and then I'll get into the reticulate in a, in a little bit. So, any questions? Yes? Um, it's more like, um, you, you think about it, like what, if, you, if, if your data, for example, might, like you say, well, I think it might benefit from convolutional layers. So you start by saying, well, let's try, uh, let's try three convolutional layers of this size and say, oh, what happened? Oh, oh, that didn't work very well. Or, uh, um, so there, it's, it's really iterative. It's really, you don't know, you don't even know, like, this layer's the key, you know, I mean, other than just by experimentation. So there's a little bit of a, of a like a, um, you know, of, of a um, alchemy kind of thing for, for getting these models working, honestly. <laughs> it's true. Um, so it's just, it's just the trial. And I think as you, if you, like, in a given domain, though, you'll probably, over time, develop better intuition about what tends to work well. Um, and then you'll, you'll go faster through that iteration over time. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's a good good question. Yeah, it tends to be um, in that like it's re very complex, noisy data, right? So like the traditional vector data that we do a lot of prediction on is is not as noisy or complex, and therefore it tends to not 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 necessarily benefit from that much. So like, that's why perceptual tests, you know, sound data or language or pictures are real, have a lot in them. Um, so much in them that it's, it's like, it's our hard to even like kind of algorithmically reason. That's the traditional approach. We're gonna algorithmically reason about how to extract meaning from the data. And the idea is there's so much richness that we can't, you know, we, we can't successfully algorithmically reason about it. We're just gonna let the computer do this like, search over this huge space. So that tends to be, so like in time series, it'd be like data that has a lot of seasonality, a lot of like overlapping seasonal noise, you know, that you might get better predictions out of a deep learning model than, than, a, um, than a classical model. Yeah. So in order to try the, the like, yeah. have to have a No, you, I would say um, um, any, anything that's, Convolutional models are painful uh, on a uh, on a CPU, but like a lot of the examples, so we have examples of training like an image classifier with just dense layers. That's what I just did, uh, and that was fast. So um, if you want to do like real computer vision, you're going to need a GPU. But just to, to kick the tires and try some examples, even you know like a, a, a like a convolutional model on a CPU might take 13 minutes to train. A really big one might take two hours to train. So you know, if you're, it's certainly possible to learn and experiment without a GPU. Um, but I think like doing, 
work with sequences or images, you'll probably need it eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you have to vectorize the data somehow. Um, you know, you have to find some way of, of representing it as vectors. And um, images are pretty straightforward. Um, text, as we said, there's different ways of thinking about representing text. Mostly for vector data, though, they just like um, center and mean scale the data. The, the, one of the things I didn't say is that the, the, um, the, the training of the network works on making very, very small changes. So they're making the, the optimizers making these like teeny little changes. Um, and so it, it works best with data that's like scaled from zero to one or negative one to one. So you, so most data ultimately needs to get normalized into like zero to one or negative one to one somehow. Um, and like for vector data, they just center and mean scale. But you know, um, images, it's pretty straightforward to take. You'd have to find some way to to treat the gene expression data so that it gets to be in a form that the model can successfully train against. So somehow, I don't know enough about gene expression data to say how you would do that, but you would you get it so it's zero to one or negative one to one or whatever. So yeah, and then you're, you're giving it one giant tensor. You know, the data comes in as like a matrix or a three, you know, 3D or 4D tensor. So you get everything packed into one matrix or array all scaled into the zero to one, negative one to one, then, then, it, can, then it can successfully train. Yeah, if you have like one uh, biological attribute, you represent it by genetic code, and then you have another one, this is like one big vector for that person. In our kind of world, we don't want to talk about one person, right? And so when we talk about large data sets, I'm not talking about wide, small data sets. So the more yeah. I, I do know there's this project, I don't have the, I can send uh, over the link that Google just announced, which was basically they, a bunch of different types of gene expression data that they basically built um, importers that will import them to to what's called TF record, which is the standard format for TensorFlow training data. So they, those probably have some knowledge baked into them about what's a useful, useful set of transformations. Um, and they, they support all these different input formats and things. So that, that's, looking at that project might give you some insight, you know? Because they're basically, they're like staging the data up to be read into a model. So my guess is they're going to try to do, you know, do some transformations for you in that context.